All right, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to my session about Blazor. Uh, hopefully everybody's had a good conference so far. My name's Ed Charbonneau, I'm a developer advocate for Progress. Uh, I work on the Telerik products for Progress. I'm an author and I'm frequently on Twitter. If you guys have any questions later, feel free to hit me on Twitter by my name. So welcome to Goodbye JavaScript. Hello, Blazor. So we're going to talk about Blazor today, a new framework from Microsoft that lets us build SPA applications using .NET. Uh, now, what if I told you we could write client-side web applications using only C Sharp? Uh, to many .NET developers like myself, this sounds like something that we've always wanted. And we've actually tried this before. Uh, some of those things uh, worked out well. Some may not. Um, Web Forms, uh, in my opinion, was really successful. There's a lot of Web Forms applications that are still out there. They're still being built uh, and maintained. Um, Silverlight, however, had a little bit of an early demise, so it's not around and supported anymore. Uh, so it's probably time to, to move away from Silverlight. Uh, but uh, you'll see that Blazor's uh, something that we can migrate to from these technologies. So Blazor is a brand new framework uh, it gets its name from the Razor engine. So it's the browser plus Blazor is, or browser plus Razor is Blazor. And this allows us to run C Sharp and HTML in the browser. And I'm going to show you how that, uh, the .NET team accomplished that in just a minute. So uh, just some of the facts about Blazor and what it is and what it is not. Uh, so first of all, it is client-side C Sharp. We're actually going to be running uh, C Sharp on the client. It uses web standard technologies, so there's no plugins like Silverlight had. So we're, we're going to use web standards and things that already exist in the client's browser. We're not going to have to make them install anything else. And it does that through WebAssembly. So WebAssembly is the technology that's built into the browser that's going to allow this to happen. And what's nice is we, we can use .NET standard. So anything that's a .NET standard library in general should run inside of Blazor. So again, it's not a plugin. There's no, nothing for the client to install. Um, it's not web forms all over again. There are some similarities here and there because it is .NET, so there's going to be things that look familiar. Um, and there's no transpilation. Uh, C Sharp code's not being turned into JavaScript. Um, in fact, our C Sharp code isn't being turned into WebAssembly either. And I'll explain how that works in just a sec. Um, so the key differences for me are that Blazor enables me as a .NET developer to use the tools and the languages that I'm familiar with so I can be more productive. So there's nothing really wrong with JavaScript. And the, the takeaway from this talk isn't really to bash JavaScript or say that we shouldn't use it anymore. But I wanted to share some of the strengths that, that I find with Blazor. And that is that I can use .NET standard libraries, so things that I've already written in C Sharp. Uh, things that existed before Blazor I can use, and I have some examples of that I can share. I'm using the MS Build pipeline, so I'm using the build engine that I'm used to using. I'm not going off and using Webpack or something that is completely foreign uh, to the development stack that I'm used to. And of course, C Sharp, that strong typed language that I enjoy working in, uh, works inside of Blazor, and I don't need to switch between JavaScript and C Sharp when I'm working front end and back end. Uh, so these are some of the things that make Blazor really productive for me. Um, so I don't have to use those JavaScript technologies that I'm not familiar with, like NPM, Webpack, and TypeScript. So I talked a little bit about WebAssembly. Let's clear up exactly what WebAssembly is, because that's how Blazor on the client side is being enabled. So WebAssembly is a web standard format. And it's assembly-like language uh, that allows the web page to execute code. And this is what makes Blazor possible. Now, Blazor is this fully functional a uh, single page or spy application framework that has uh, everything from dependency injection to a uh, robust component model, um, everything that you need to build a spa application. Uh, it even has uh, component packages, which is what my company focuses on. We uh, build co UI components for every ecosystem on the web, and Blazor is one of those things that we build these UI components for. So Blazor has two models of operation. It has a server and a client-side model. 
So we'll talk about both of these. I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail on the client side model because that seems to be something that people are really uh, focused on uh, when they talk about Blazor and something that people are really excited about. So let's talk about how the client side actually works. In a normal uh, browser application or JavaScript application, we download our JavaScript to the browser. That JavaScript gets parsed. It gets compiled and turned into an abstract syntax tree. It gets then turned into bytecode. That bytecode then interacts with the DOM, calling DOM APIs and those things. WebAssembly opens up a new interface for us. So instead of going through that JavaScript pipeline and having the browser parse and compile our JavaScript inside of the browser itself, we're actually opening up a new interface here where we can put bytecode directly into the browser through WebAssembly. So WebAssembly is what's enabling uh, this new technology that you're going to see. So what Microsoft has done is they've taken, uh, well, first of all, uh, WebAssembly does open up the ecosystem as well. So you see here we can use things like C++ and C Sharp uh, and compile those things outside of the browser instead of having to go through that JavaScript pipeline. So this, this opens things up, and this is what allows Microsoft to do what they're doing, and that is compile the .NET runtime to WebAssembly and run that directly in the browser. So this means I don't have to compile my code to another language. I don't have to transpile from something to JavaScript. I just need to run .NET code in the browser in the .NET runtime, just like a normal .NET application. So we have the .NET runtime in the browser, and Blazor uh, is loaded up on top of that. And then our application code uh, gets loaded into the browser as well. So we're actually shipping DLLs down the wire to the browser and running them on the client. Uh, Server-side Blazor is a very interesting option. Uh, this is really nice for line of business applications. And how uh, server-side Blazor works is we're actually running all the application code on the server, and we're treating the, the browser as a thin client. So there's a small JavaScript file that gets delivered to the browser, and that sets up a SignalR connection between the server and the browser. So now we have a thin client that we can work with. That thin client is responsible for DOM updates and those type of things. And whenever there's an event on the client, it sends a message up to the server using SignalR, performs any work, and then sends down just a difference between what the UI uh, is and what it should be. So we're, if we change like an H1 tag, that's the only thing that's going to come across the wire. We're not repainting the whole page. And that actually goes across as binary. So it's a very small packet of information. And then the client side, uh, thin client uh, part of the framework picks up and replaces that element for us. So it's a very lightweight, um, very responsive way of building applications. Uh, and there's a couple uh, trade-offs between these two models. So on the client side, uh, we have little to no server overhead. We can host these things on GitHub pages. They're static files. Um, it's, again, it's a typical web scenario, so it's a RESTful uh, type of application, meaning that we have web, web APIs we're interacting with for data on the server, so we're in a disconnected environment. Um, this allows also things like offline mode and PWAs to be built with Blazor client-side is a very interesting prospect. Uh, the downsides are the larger payload side, so, size. So we're shipping the .NET framework across the wire, which can be a little bit on the large side, something that the .NET team is currently working on. Um, it's a disconnected environment, so we have to make API calls to get data from our server. Uh, it is uh, not supported by Microsoft yet. So support is actually coming in May. So I'd look around the build time frame for the official uh, RTM version of client-side Blazor. So you can use it today in preview, uh, but there's no support yet. Server-side Blazor has very small payload size because it's only shipping that small client package across that little SignalR um, service that it has. Uh, what's nice, though, is it has a lot less abstraction because we're already on the server. We may actually be on the same server with our database. We can inject entity framework directly into the application and use it without 
writing a whole abstraction layer of uh, using web API calls. So the uptime on uh, getting a server-side application is uh, the development time is very, very short. Um, it also has pre-rendering enabled out of the box. It's extremely fast. Um, it is supported today. So Microsoft has already released support for this uh, several months ago. And uh, that happened during .NET Conf. So since .NET Conf, this has been officially supported by Microsoft in ASP.NET 3.0. Downside is you have to have a connection all the time. That WebSocket has to be able to communicate to the server. So that's something to keep in mind. And resources are on your dime. So if you have a big Azure instance that's running all of the code, then obviously you're paying for any kind of computation that happens there. The client side, you're not going to have that. Uh, one thing that I really like about Blazor is that it has a very simple component model that is extremely scalable, and you can sum it all up in this one slide. So a component is made up of directives, which give a component special abilities, uh, like page routing, uh, which you can see in this example. Um, they, they also contain markup. This is just standard HTML markup that can include Razor and other components. So it's very easy uh, to, to use because it's just HTML. And then we, we have our, our code block or our logic uh, for that component. Uh, we can put these in the same view. We could separate those code files out as well. Uh, but generally, if it's something simple, you'll see it like this, where we have the code right in uh, the component itself. And you can see data binding is very simple. I'll show some live demos of this as well. But uh, we simply use Razor to connect our, our data to uh, the display and we can bind to click events. And this is all C-sharp. There's no JavaScript here. Routing is very simple. Um, routing uses a directive. So we can set up a page directive. Uh, we can even pass in query string variables and accept those into our component very easily using the syntax. So in this example, we're, we're taking in a parameter and displaying that up on the page. And that's, that's how you would set that up with the routing in Blazor. Dependency injection comes baked into the framework as well. So we can inject things like uh, HTTP client. And if you've written any .NET code that's done HTTP work before, you'll see that this is very familiar. We're injecting uh, an HTTP client and then calling get JSON async to grab some data. So I'll show, I'll show some demos of that here. And uh, we'll go ahead and, and do that just in a second. So we'll get started. Uh, just to let you know what the prereq prerequisites are if you want to try this out. Um, if you're going to do any client-side Blazor, you're going to want to grab the latest version of .NET Core. Uh, so right now, it's 3.1 Preview 2 is what just released uh, two days ago. So uh, this is very bleeding edge stuff I'm about to show. So if anything goes wrong, it's not my fault, I promise. <laughs> uh, we need Visual Studio 2019 latest preview, which shipped, uh, I believe, yesterday. Um, it was updating on my machine just about an hour ago. So again, if something breaks, I have other people to blame. Uh, <laughs> um, we're we're going to do some file new project stuff. You'll see there's two different projects in the file new project dialog. We have our Blazor WebAssembly project, which is the client side model, and the Blazor server project, which is the server side model. So it's demo time. Let's uh, break away from the slides for a few minutes and take a look at Blazor and see how it works. So again, I'm opening Visual Studio, which you can't see. Uh, let's uh, change presentation modes here. See if we can get that up on the screen properly. So we have Visual Studio 2019 Preview. And I'm going to do Create a New Project. And I'll be choosing Blazor App. And you'll notice that I get a dialog box that has two projects in it. Um, I noticed a little bug earlier. So if you see this happen, you only have one project. You need to install those. Um, Blazor WebAssembly app templates, and then sometimes toggling the um, version of ASP.NET Core you have will light those up as well, because we're on preview, uh, 3.1 preview. So we're only going to find that web app, um, WebAssembly app in that 3.1 uh, 3 dialog. 
So go ahead and create this WebAssembly application. Again, this is going to be all static resources. So this is an application that we don't need a server to host. We could put this on GitHub pages or Azure blob storage or something like that, and it would run perfectly fine, which is something that's new for .NET. We haven't been able to do uh, web applications without some sort of server or IAS um, for, for our apps. Uh, in our file new project experience, we'll see uh, the directory structure is pretty simple. Um, it's not MVC, so there's no model view controller. Um, it's very similar to Razor Pages, if you've done any Razor Pages. So you'll notice there's a Pages folder and a Shared folder. Uh, we'll find all of our components under Pages here. All of our static um, resources, like JavaScript, if we have any, or CSS, will be under WW root, uh, images, things like that. So we'll jump into pages here. We've got a couple simple um, application examples in here. We'll go ahead and run this before we start digging into the code. So we'll give this a little build and uh, let this run. And we're going to see there's two examples. There's a counter component and a fetch data component. Uh, there's also an index page. And uh, we'll have a little fun with this for a few minutes and see what exactly uh, the component model gives us uh, and the file new project experience gives us here. So we've got a counter component. It's a very simple example, uh, but it does a lot for us. Um, and uh, we can play with this a little bit. So if we click the button, it counts the increment, uh, increments the count up. And uh, we also have a fetch data. So we can click on fetch data, and it will pull uh, data from, in this case, a static file. It's actually grabbing a JSON file and parsing that out for us. So let's take a look at the code. And this is the counter component. So you'll notice that the counter component has a page directive, so it has a route. So we're able to navigate to this component, and it acts as a page. Uh, when we give a page a route, or a component a route, it's still a component. We can still use it as a component. Now, components in Blazor uh, are very reusable. Uh, we can put those on other pages. So for example, I could go to my index page, and I could create a new instance of that counter component just by coming in and saying counter and closing that tag. So that is a reuse of our counter component. It's very simple. So uh, now I have two instances of my counter component. So I have a counter component I can navigate to. And now I have one on my index page as well, and those are both separate instances of that component. Um, the component itself is just made up of some simple markup. We have an H1 tag. That's our counter. We have our current count being displayed with a little bit of a razor uh, syntax here. So we're displaying the current count field uh, of our, our class that we have. And we're also binding to an on-click event. So we're going to bind to the increment count method. You can see light up here in the code section. So this is all C sharp. All C sharp code. There's no JavaScript here at all. So I'm going to save this um, index page, and we'll, we'll light this up again. We'll go back to the browser and see that we have these two separate instances of our counter component. Uh, so we should have one on our index page now where we didn't have it before. So I can click that, increments. Um, I go to my counter route. I have another instance. Again, it's at 0, so we're, we're not sharing any state there or anything like that. Um, so now we have these two counter components. Um, let's, uh, let's see how we can expand this um, component model a little bit, because we need to be able to give values to components, right? So we're going to go over to our code section, and let's expand this counter component so it can be, uh, it c we can enable it to count by different values. So let's add a parameter to it. And I'm going to add, I'm going to use a little code snippet to kind of shorten this up a little bit. But what we have is a basic uh, class property. And it's been decorated with a parameter attribute. So that tells Blazor that this is a, an input for our component. And we'll go ahead and set this as an integer, and we'll call it count by. And I'm going to go ahead and just default this to 1 in case somebody doesn't set a value for it. It doesn't do nothing. And now we just need to change our logic a little bit, because we are just incrementing by 1. So what we want to do is actually increment by count by. So now when I have a component, I can set this count by uh, value. And we can count by a different uh, set of numbers. 
So I can go back to my counter component, and I can say count by. And already IntelliSense is lit up with that parameter, so I can set it. And it also knows that it's an integer value. So I'm going to say 5. So now my counter on my home page will count as 5, and my counter that is at the counter route will still be 1. So it's very easy to create components and pass values in and make them change their behavior. So this, this component model is very easy to work with. You can see I'm counting by fives now. Maybe a little hard to see in the back there, but uh, we're, we're counting by five on the home page, and we're counting by ones on the counter route. I switched tabs by accident there. So there we go. So we, we've got fives and ones. Uh, we've also got our... Um, our fetch data component. Let's talk about that for a minute, because it's doing something a little bit different. So the fetch data component is actually utilizing dependency injection. So we've got our inject method up here, or directive at the top. And this tells dependency injection to go ahead and resolve a uh, HTTP client instance for us. And it's going to pull that out of the dependency injection system uh, that's baked in. And in the, our code section, we're going to call get JSON async, and we're actually just going to fetch a flat file here. We're going to go grab weather.json. But for all intents and purposes, this could be an HTTP call to anywhere. It could be a GitHub API. It could be anything. And we're going to pull data back as a C, uh, C Sharp class. So weather forecast class is coming back an array of weather forecasts. So we're, um, the framework is actually doing all of the parsing um, and uh, serialization and deserialization uh, between JSON for us. So we don't even have to worry about that. Uh, we're going to await that function and set our forecast uh, field. Once we have that, we'll iterate over that field and display those uh, table columns. So it's uh, pretty straightforward stuff here. Um, let's go ahead and do another file new project because I want to show the difference between client-side and server-side Blazor, and you can really see that difference in the, um, the fetch data component that they give you as part of the example. So I'm going to go to the server-side app here. I'm going to click Create. And we're going to get an identical experience here, um, except for a folder called Data. So before, we didn't have this Data folder. And this is going to tie into our weather forecast component that we're, we're working with. Oh, come on. Uh, my zoom has broken, my little zoom tool. I was going to zoom in on this for you. This is uh, weatherforecast.cs for the folks in the back, and weather forecast service, which is a service that will fetch some uh, random weather data for us. Um, it's just doing this through random, a random number generator, but this could be a database, for example. It could be Entity Framework sitting back here pulling data out for us. I'm going to go into Pages and back over to Fetch Data. And we have almost the same setup here, except the inject directive is different. In server-side Blazor, we're on the server already, so we can inject services that exist uh, on the server, and we can inject Entity Framework even directly into this component and utilize it, because we don't have that HTTP call that we have to make to get the data. So I'm going to inject a weather forecast service, and we resolve it almost the exact same way here, but I'm going to call service get forecast async. Now, what get forecast async does behind the scenes, we really don't even need to, need to care about. Uh, but we know it's going to return a array of weather forecasts, and then we can then iterate over it. So you'll see there's a little bit of difference um, in how we call services and get data uh, between server-side and client-side Blazor. But the component itself, the markup section, uh, the routing, and all of that remains unchanged. This is all the same logic across um, either server-side or client-side Blazor. And what's nice about this is that I can write my services where they abstract away how it's getting the data, and then I don't even need to worry about how my components are written, whether they'll work on client or server-side Blazor. I can make them completely agnostic. Uh, it's where they can run anywhere. So let's give this a run. 
we'll take a look at the two applications running, and I'll show some other differences between the two uh, models. So this is the same counter application. I, I didn't put the uh, custom uh, counter implementation here, but we have our basic Hello World app with our fetch data and our counter component. Um, it's a little bit hard to see in such a simple scenario, but the client side app is much, much faster, or sorry, the server side app is much, much quicker than the client side application. Uh, it looks like I may have closed my server or client app, so we'll get that back up and running. I want to show the two side by side. Uh, there are some key differences in how they're, they're operating. Um, while that loads up, we will take our server-side application here. I'm going to do inspect, and I'll grab the network tab. And I'm going to empty the cache here and just completely reload the application. And we'll see the resources that come across the wire. So we've got less than a half a meg of data that's been transferred over. This is uh, a lot of you know, static files like CSS files. Uh, there's a small JavaScript file in here uh, that boots up the, uh, the client-side application of this uh, and establishes the SignalR connection. So this is actually the SignalR connection here. And you can see these binary messages that are in the queue. We'll scoot this screen over a little bit. Um, and if I click on my counter, you'll see the binary messages being sent across the wire. So it may be a little hard to see. I'll give it a couple more clicks. You can see the uh, scroll bar kind of uh, bouncing over here. Those are the sig signal R packages going up to the server saying, I clicked a button, what happened? And then the server says, change the 1 to a 2, the 2 to a 3, and so on. If we go back to our client-side app, We'll give this a run. We're going to see a different set of information come across the network. And uh, this is where we can really see how client and server-side Blazor are different. So here's our client-side application again. We'll do inspect here. And we will empty the cache on that guy and reload the page. Take a look at our network tab. It's a little bit more busy. So I see some grimacing faces. Uh, yes, that's 2.4 megs that went over the wire. Uh, so again, we're, we are shipping the .NET framework and DLLs over the wire. So it's a little bit heavy right now. Uh, so this is why Microsoft has extended the, the uh, support date out to, um, to May. Uh, it's because they're still working on trimming this down and making it a little bit more efficient, uh, sending that data across the wire. So there's something in Blazor that we use called the IL linker. And if you're familiar with tree shaking in JavaScript, it's a very similar concept. So what we're going to do is look through the code and see what paths the code is using, so what methods it's calling. And that IL linker will then shake out anything that's not being used and reduce the size of those DLL files down and make this a little bit more palatable to send to clients. So there's some. There's some performance tweaks that are happening right now that hopefully we see by May uh, that'll make this a little bit better. Uh, we are seeing DLLs shipping across the wire. So these are DLLs that are actually running in the application on the client. So this is pretty cool stuff. Um, one thing that's interesting about this is people ask about security a lot when they see this. Um, there's a, a couple uh, discussions to be had. One is, uh, can um, can clients decompile the code and look at the code? Well, of course they can. It's on their machine. Uh, we can do this with JavaScript today, so it's not anything different than what we're already doing. So we can take JavaScript that's been sent across the wire, look at the code. Uh, it's a little bit more of an extra step to decompile C Sharp, but it is possible. Um, matter of fact, Telerik, the company I work for, has a free tool to, to decompile code. Uh, so it is something that's possible. If you have something that's um, that's got IP sensitivity, just keep it on the server as a service and call it as an API. Uh, so that it's, it's a really simple problem to fix. Um, now, these DLLs run in a sandbox, the same sandbox that JavaScript runs in. So we're not gaining any special access just because it's DLL files and .NET code. So we can't do things like go figure out who's logged in with uh, Active Directory. 
So we don't get any magic for free just because it's .NET, which also means we can't do destructive things like go get the person's registry and mess with it and install viruses and those type of things. Okay, so uh, there, there's a lot of security questions that people ask. Those are generally uh, the ones that I get. Uh, one thing that I uh, really enjoy about Blazor is the fact that we can use existing .NET code to uh, build uh, applications. Uh, this is an experiment that I did uh, when Blazor very first came out. Uh, this is called Blazedown. Uh, there's actually a live version of this on the web as well. Uh, we can actually try to hit that real quick. So what Blazedown is, is an application that, uh, you know, I saw Blazor and I thought, what does the web need more than anything? And that is another online markdown editor. That's a joke. Come on. <laughs> we don't need that. I'm sorry, we don't. But uh, I thought it was a good experiment. So I was like, let's build an online markdown editor that uh, uses .NET. And uh, I don't know anything about parsing markdown. Not a thing. Still don't. Built the app, still don't. Uh, but what I was able to do is go to NuGet and grab a NuGet package that can parse markdown into HTML. And it was very simple to wire that up into two little views. And then you can go in and edit your markdown, and it will display in the other window. So it's doing some live markdown parsing. There's no server for this. It's hosted on GitHub pages. So that's uh, something that's really cool. Um, you can actually import files directly into it, and you can also download and export files. Um, it's a couple lines of code. It's, it was really simple to write. So that, that was pretty interesting. Uh, what I've been working on lately is a project for our company. So we build UI components, and I feel like the best way to make these things uh, the best they can be for customers is to use them myself. So I've been writing some application code to not only test out Blazor, but test out our own UI components and see what I can build. So this is an application I wrote called Blazeport. It's a futuristic travel app. Uh, so we're going to travel to other planets, and we're going to get prices of travel to, from the Earth to the Moon to Mars. And uh, what we've got with Blazeport is a full stack C Sharp application. This is running server-side Blazor. It's running um, machine learning, so ML.NET. Uh, it uses Cosmos DB and SQLite uh, for data persistence. Um, I can click on new trip. This is our, one of our UI components. We have this nice fly-out effect uh, for a panel. We have drop-downs and date pickers and all the things that you need to build a robust web application right here. Uh, we can estimate the trip cost. It's going to go out to the machine learning service and ask it, all right, we have a distance, and we have a date, and we have these different inputs. Can you estimate the cost? that it's going to take to travel to the moon. And it's going to say, yeah, you have $4,908 ticket. And um, this is how long it's going to take. And um, this is the, the number of miles you're going to travel. So it's kind of a cool little demo app that, uh, that I wrote all using Blazor. And there is little to no JavaScript that I've had to write for this. There's one little piece of JavaScript I'm currently implementing. And uh, something I, I didn't get a chance to talk about yet is we have the ability to call existing JavaScript libraries through Blazor and utilize those libraries. So we have full access to JavaScript. And JavaScript also has full access to C Sharp and .NET uh, inside of Blazor. Uh, so one of the things that I'm working on with this example application. So I wanted it to have adaptive rendering technology. So what that means is if I'm on a mobile device and my screen size shrinks down, not only can I do media queries and change the layout of the page and whatnot, but I could actually swap out entire user interfaces based on uh, what that screen size is. So I'm using a little snippet of JavaScript code behind the scenes to detect the browser size and tell me how big or small it is. Uh, and I use that for uh, this flyout panel to resize it appropriately to fit the mobile screen. So you'll notice when I expand this out, it changes in instantly in size. So there's a little JavaScript call in there to say, all right, we need to go change this UI out a little bit. So th there's little things that we can do like that. We can also implement full 
um, JavaScript libraries, people have used like Google Maps and things like that. Uh, so all those capabilities are there with Blazor. I think I'm running short on time here. I may actually be going a little bit over. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and put resources up here. So if anybody wants to um, snap a photo of this, there's some good links in here. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of stuff going on on our blogs and my website. Um, I do a Twitch live show every week on Friday if I'm not traveling. And you can see me live code and fail at writing Blazor. Um, and I also have an article in Code Magazine this month. So if you're a Code Magazine subscriber, um, or you can read it online here. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter and ask questions if you'd like. Uh, so thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch.